Welcome everyone to, to, to our webinar, an Introduction to Programmatic Labeling. I'm John Marini, Director of Growth here at Snorkel AI, and I'll be your host for today's event. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Rajiv Shah. Rajiv is a Principal Data Scientist here at Snorkel AI, where his primary focus is on enabling teams to achieve success with AI. Prior to joining Snorkel AI, he was a member of data science teams at Data Robot, Caterpillar, and State Farm. Rajiv is a widely recognized speaker on AI with published research papers and patents in many domains, including sports analytics, deep learning, and interpretability. He received a PhD and a JD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And now it's my pleasure to hand the presentation over to Rajiv. All right. Thanks, John. I wanted to start by talking a little bit about how I first started in data science. I joined a large data science team on a large insurance company, and I was one of about 20 different PhDs that they hired. And when they hired us, they basically took us, put us all in one room, and it was a cool room, right? We had like these whiteboards all over the place and kind of, as you can imagine, right, data scientists, we were very into kind of algorithms and theory and kind of writing things up on the boards and talking, and it was a great time. And this, you know, part of what we did was we spent a little bit of time kind of training machine learning models, right? We wanted to do that. But the types of problems and the data sets we used were we largely focused on existing data sets that were already out there. So we grabbed things like academic data sets, or maybe we went to Kaggle, right? The place that has data science competitions, grabbed existing data sets from them. And you know, that was our starting point for understanding and kind of starting to solve problems. Now, this limitation of labeled data was you know, something that was hard. And I remember at one point going and knocking on doors literally within the company, looking for people that had interesting projects to work on. And I found one, one potential partner. You know, they had a great opportunity for where predictive analytics, AI, could help solve some problems for them. And I took them, had them meet with my data science lead to talk about how you know, I could take on and work on this project. And you know, I was excited, uh, you know, the, the partner on the other side was excited about kind of this potential collaboration and helping them. But my data science lead pushed back on them. I, and I was like, you know, why? And you know, for him, this was an interesting problem but they didn't have the data prepared properly. It wasn't in, in a nice tabular form. It didn't have labels with it. And he understood that if the data isn't prepared that, like that, you know, giving a group of 20 PhDs and having them spend kind of a bunch of time going out and labeling the data, right? Days, weeks to label all of that data, was it going to fly, right? Like we'd be back on LinkedIn the following week looking for a new place where we want to do the data science that we wanted to do around building models. And I see this impediment for kind of labeling data, you know, many, many times. You know, since then, I've had a number of different roles. You know, previous to Snorkel, I worked at an auto ML vendor and we developed a great technology where if you had labeled data, you could get quickly get a very accurate and explainable model. But when I went and talked to data science teams, asking them like, hey, you know, how's it going with this? You know, are you building out real things? You know, I found most data science teams weren't able to fully take advantage of this. They had to spend a lot of time preparing, labeling and getting their data ready to be able to bring forward. And so this is kind of a repeating problem where I see is that you know, there's so much potential in enterprises for AI, but it's just hard to access all that data and take advantage of it. So what I want to do today is talk about a strategy, programmatic labeling, that can Im greatly improve the speed for developing AI. So I'm going to walk through it. I want to make this interactive. I think we're going to put some polls in, allow you to give feedback. If you have questions, feel free to ask them. I told John, hey, hey if, if there's a good question that comes in that fits, just ask me right during the seminar, right during the, the session. We don't always have to wait till the end. So want to make this useful for all of you as well. So let's talk about an alternative here. We're going to talk about programmatic labeling. And before we do that, though, I want to ask you, right, this is the polling questions, is how big of a problem is labeled data for your enterprise? 
And I think John is going to kick off the poll here and we'll get a little bit of feedback. And then please, everybody, participate. It'll make it a little bit better and always helps us understand where everybody else is on these things. Great. <clears throat> Everyone, you should see the poll up on your screen now. So we'll take a couple seconds here for folks to. Um, oh, I love the numbers coming in like this. It's fun. I can see them on my side. All Great. right. It looks like about half of folks have responded. So we'll go ahead and we're going to close the poll. All right. Yeah. Only a tiny bit said it wasn't an issue, right? The vast majority of it's a you know major or significant issue as well. So, okay. You all feel the pain. Let's talk about a way that we can kind of start to address that pain. Programmatic labeling. For those of you who know me, I like to always explain things very simple. I'm going to use a very simple example that I think we all intuitively understand. Can we detect if a message is spam? or ham, which in this case is not spam. Just because I use this very simple um, example, I don't want you to think that programmatic labeling is very is limited to just kind of simple classification like this. You know, we have lots of use cases with programmatic labeling where we'll work with kind of complex multi-page PDF documents, or maybe we'll work at the level of a word or token and do entity extraction, named entity extraction. You know, other use cases that are potential for programmatic labeling are working with images or time series data. So while I want to give you the nuance and understand kind of how this works, just be aware that there's a lot of good use cases we can use programmatic labeling for. So let's think about this. Let's start. To build a traditional machine learning model that helps us differentiate between kind of spam and ham, we start with a lot of labeled examples to teach the computer. So let's talk about how we do that. Let's go label the data. Now, generally, the approach is you start with some type of annotation tool. A lot of fancy tools out there, but I see day in and day out, folks still using Excel to be able to do their annotation. So I kind of use that as my example. Now, don't worry about the exact words in, in these messages here. This is just to be illustrative as we go through there. So I've had people try to read every word on this slide. Don't sweat that. What I want you to do is though, is look at the top, the top message. And the idea I wanna get for you is that, you know, traditional annotation works by having somebody go, I'm gonna move my image here because sometimes that causes issues. Traditional annotation works by having somebody read the message, right? They think about it, they, they evaluate it. And then, you know, based on their judgment or some guidelines, they'll go ahead and in this case, label it as spam. And they'll move on to the next message, hmm, right? Take a look at this, try and understand it. In this case, this looks like a real message. So they'll label it as ham. And they continue to do this, right? They keep going down the list, message after message to do this. In this case, we'll add spam. Now, the whole process here of kind of going down and labeling all this stuff, this is, this is what can take a ton of time to do and where kind of it gets frustrating for teams because it takes kind of days, weeks to kind of label the data. Now, I have another little question we're going to ask here as we go through this, and then I'll go into the depths of programmatic labeling. So how do you, how do all of you look, do your labeling? Are you relying on your data science team, annotation teams? Do you outsource it, SMEs? And I'll let John kick off that poll as well. Oh, yes. All right. It's coming up. So you can see where you stack compared to um, your colleagues here on this poll. It looks like it's pretty well distributed. Huh? All right. All right. Oh, SMEs are coming out ahead here. I don't know. Do they get to see the live, John? Or am I? Yeah, they'll, just they'll a, get to they'll see, get see the live. In a second. Um, All right. So we're going to close the poll, everyone. And everyone should see the results. So it looks like Excellent. SMEs did pull uh, out ahead for the majority of the most yeah. frequent response. All right. So let's talk about using those SMEs here in a minute too. But again, like we, we, the process here is to get those labels. So now let's move on to the alternative is programmatic labeling instead of the manual labeling that we showed earlier. Now with programmatic labeling, we're going to start in the same place where we have these messages. But I want you to think about it differently. I wanted you to think about how we could turn this process of labeling 
into code. Now, when we turn it into code, kind of think about the steps that you're doing as you're reading these messages. You know, for me, as I'm kind of reading a message and identifying, you know, is this likely to be something I want to read or not? I kind of skim it. I'm a skimmer. I might just look at the keywords. And if I see keywords like investments, ugh, right, or get rich, you know, those are kind of like yellow flags to me. Like, hey, wait a minute. You know, this could be a junk email or, you know, another phrase is as seen now. So that's one kind of heuristic that I use for identifying if something is junk email. Something else I might consider is, have I received this message before from a person, right? Is this the first time kind of interacting or have I had repeated contact, right? And I could build a simple heuristic saying, you know, if the email matches what's in my address book, well, you know what? In that case, maybe that's an indicator that that's an acceptable message. So the programmatic approach is gonna depend on turning these concepts into kind of code, or if you're an Excel user, you don't know anything about coding, think about it in terms of formulas in Excel. But we could build a simple formula that just says, hey, if a certain keyword shows up, I wanna label this message as spam. Or, right, if there's a match between the emails that I'm receiving, we'll label that as not. So now let's start and let's take these kind of formulas and codes and let me apply them and show you how this works. We go back to all of our messages. I'm gonna start with that first. And the term we use in Snorkel for these heuristics is labeling function. So you'll see me mix that in. So let's take this labeling function we have of investments. And now I'm gonna just apply this all the way down every message and say, you know, any place where the word investment shows up, I want to label that a spam. And then I'm going to keep up adding my other keywords to do that. We'll add get rich in a CNAS. And you can start seeing we're starting to get a little bit of signal to understand how to label these messages. Let's keep moving on and we'll add in, you know, it, does this email match? Now we're building a richer set of signals. Now at this point, I could just simply stop and tabulate and see where I'm at. And the way I tabulated this was pretty simple. I just took a look. So for example, at the top row, I saw, hey, I have two spams. So I'm gonna give the entire message a vote of spam. The next one down, you know, I had one ham, so I gave it as a ham. Now you'll see that there's some here in the middle where we have that have an abstain vote. And that happens because the labeling functions we're using, these heuristics, don't apply to every message. Sometimes we might not know how to categorize them. Other times we might have conflicts between them. So in this case, and we just kind of put our hands up in this case and say, okay, well, we're not sure. So let's abstain for now. Now, this combination and bringing all of these things together, well, that's a big part of the theoretical work that's gone on with programmatic labeling. So programmatic labeling came out of the Stanford AI labs about seven years ago, is kind of the predominant work that we see here at Snorkel. And a lot of it was dealing with when you have all these different heuristics or labeling functions, how do you deal with them when they overlap or when they conflict with each other and reconciling all of that? Now, as you'll see, we'll go through the workflow here, here is an important part is reconciling all those getting some of the labeled data, which we were just able to do. And then what we do is we take that labeled data, we pass that over to a traditional kind of machine learning model. And the reason we do that is because as you'll see, the labeling functions here don't cover every single point. Not every message is covered, but by moving to a machine learning model, we're able to generalize to all those examples. So let me make this concrete. Imagine one of the messages here was about a new venture. Now, the new venture here wouldn't fall into our existing heuristics, right? It's, it's not an investment. It's not a get rich. It seems like it could be, eh, you know, in that same kind of ballpark of a message. But this is where having and taking this 
and passing it to a machine learning model and not just relying on the straight heuristics is useful because the machine learning model will be able to generalize these labels that I've provided to an example like New Venture. All right. So if that didn't sink in, let me know and I can kind of go over it one more time in, in the questions as well. But I think th these are some important concepts to understand with programmatic labeling. Yeah, and I do see one of our participants has a hand raised. If you would like to uh, chat your question to us, we'll be happy to take it live. Yeah, here. I'll do my best to answer these on the fly. So yes, I'll give it a second and see if they have. I'll let you know, Raj, uh, okay. if it comes in. Yeah, so now that we have the labeled messages, let's keep walking through this example where what we'll do is we'll pass it to a classification algorithm. And, doesn't matter what classification algorithm we use for this case, but once we do that, we can get a score. So an F1 is a performance score that's used by data scientists. So we can just think about it as understanding how well the model's doing. And we get an 83% here. That's great. Now, if you're like, well, I don't think 83% is good enough. I want a higher score. Well, typically what a data scientist would do at this point is, okay, well, 83 isn't good enough. Well, let me go back. I'll go try some other algorithms. I might try some hyperparameter tuning or some auto ML or some model centric approach to improve the score. But I wanna actually show you something else. I wanna show you a data centric approach where we can actually improve this model by focusing on the quality of the data. And we start this by looking and seeing how well the model performs on different slices or areas of the data. And if we look at this, this is a, what's called a confusion matrix um, in machine learning. And I, I want you to focus on this number 14 here. What we see here is the difference is that there's been 14 times where my model thought the message wasn't junk email, but it actually was. So these are messages that are sneaking by. If we can improve the model to fix those, we can improve the overall performance. So how do we do that? You know, right? How do we do better catch these? So one thing is exactly what a lot of you do for annotation is this approach that I'm using is not about a data scientist working alone. It's about going down the hall and grabbing a subject matter expert and including them in the conversation. And, Later, as you'll talk, we'll talk about the snorkel flow of the platform. An important part of that is keeping that SME in the loop. But if you go talk to your subject matter experts, they might say, hey, misspellings are really important. Right? Misspellings give you an indicator that something is a message. Or you might find out that your email administrator down the hall, she has a known list of good addresses. So bringing in these multiple signals is an important part of programmatic labeling. We can just convert again these into different types of labeling functions, whether it's using an external model, whether it's using this kind of dictionary of safe addresses. So let's bring them in. We'll add them in. You can see here, all we do is simply kind of add that as another signal, as another column, add in the dictionary as well. We're going to then take all of these. And now you can see we're even building just a richer set of information as you continue to add these labeling functions. Go ahead and let's aggregate again and get their votes. And when we go through the exercise the second time, take all of these, you know, identify the labeled data, pass that to a classification algorithm. One of the things we'll see here is that we were actually able to improve the performance by providing richer, higher quality data on the labels, we can actually improve this. And this is one of the cool things, and this is what gets me really excited about kind of snorkel, is the ability to just improve data quality, which has an effect on the model quality as well. All right, okay. So next I wanna kind of move on to see how this show you I've given you this toy example of how it works. Let's talk about some real world use cases of how this actually affects it. So before I do that, John, I will take a pause here and see if there's questions that make sense to fit in, or otherwise I can always answer them at the end as well. 
None have come in. Just a reminder, it's a good opportunity, folks. Feel free to ask questions either in the Q&A pane or in chat as we're going along. Okay. All right. So I want to go through a couple examples now of how this changes it to make it a little bit more kind of from the toy example into something um, that people have done. I, we did have one more polling question to ask to just make sure your kind of keyboards are working. It's just what kind of data is everybody working with? Is it text, images, structured data, time series? I think I wanted to have an other option, but the polling didn't support that. So I guess maybe you can use the chat if none of those um, fit what you have as well. It's fun to see the bars move. Great. Looks like yeah. most folks are coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And uh, everyone, you should see the results on your screen. Yeah, no, that's great. Text and structured data, of course, right? Those are both well, well out there in that. Awesome. Okay. So let's, let's apply this, give you guys um, some good examples of like how this actually works. The first example I'm using is kind of a public case study of using Snorkel. There's a story on Google's blog. There's the research paper for this is available on archive. So if you want to dig into the details, you can. But this is one an early project that was working with Google where there's a team that managed over 100 different topic and product classifiers. So, and as you can imagine, kind of building classifiers for all of these involved a large amount of data. And one thing they wanted to do as a team was, you know, avoid manual labeling to make sure that they could kind of easily, you know, add new ones, update all of these as well. So this is where programmatic labeling came in. Let's talk about how they did this with programmatic labeling. Same ideas that we talked about in terms of these labeling functions or heuristics. Now, what they did for theirs is, you know, some of the heuristics that they used were keywords URL-based heuristics. And I like to clump these as things like text patterns and taking advantage of that. Some other pieces of information they brought in for when they were creating them is they already had existing models. In this case, they had existing named entity recognition models. They had existing internal topic models as well. So they brought in that information to help with the labeling. And finally, they had Google's knowledge graph that contained a ton of information. And this is where I always encourage enterprises, hey, if you already have existing knowledge bases and dictionaries, a great thing about programmatic labeling is it can leverage all that information. You don't have to create it anew. Now, by bringing all of this together, they were able to take all of this, kind of use the snorkel approach, and they were able to label and go from labeling in weeks, right, days, down to just hours by using this approach. And it scales really nicely. So even though they had very large data sets, it was able to work easily across that. And then the bonus, and of course, you know, my favorite thing is, is that it was actually able to improve the model performance by using this approach. So that's, that's an, a great example, kind of any of you can kind of go dig into as well. So I like working besides with, besides text data, I like working with like structured time series, some of the other ones there. So the second use case is one closer to my heart around classifying network traffic. And here you can think of very structured data where it's, you have numerics, categoricals, you have actually some text. And what you want to do is classify by application type. And th this is very common for large telecommunications, for government agencies that are doing kind of cybersecurity. So another case is sometimes um, folks want to kind of evaluate the customer experience of their products and they have similar data. And by bringing this information in and then taking advantage of the labeling functions, whether you're using things like known patterns that the SMEs will tell you like, hey, you know, this IP address will do that, right? This IP subnet is likely to have this type of traffic. And you can see we have kind of built in these labeling function builders to make it easy for a subject matter expert, somebody that's not a coder to still build these out. If they are coders, we can kind of take advantage of that code and bring that in as well. And as well as exploring the data to build these labeling functions. And you know, some of the labeling functions we've used is we've used information around server name lists, which are often kind of text-based lists. 
We have the ability to auto generate labeling functions based on a little bit of data. We have models that will go ahead and create those as well as using knowledge bases and dictionaries. But again, I just want to give you the sense of like all the different types of information you have within your enterprise. We want to bring those to bear to help reduce that time for labeling. And here's some kind of concrete results so you can get an understanding of you know, how well the, this, this can perform. And we're happy to, I'm happy to send you other examples and other kind of academic papers that also have this, but I think this is just very illustrative so that you understand that you know, one of the potentials of using an approach like Snorkel is you can get performance on par and sometimes even better with only having a little bit of labeled data. Right? And after all, I mean, that's the point here. We all kind of share the pain that it's hard to get enough labeled data to kind of build and especially feed kind of the massive uh, models that are out there nowadays. All right. So let me just end by kind of highlighting a little bit about kind of snorkel, snorkel and kind of snorkel flow as well. So, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I broke my train of thought here. And again, just to reiterate, right, the, the, the reason what excites me here is by kind of take advantage of programmatic labeling. You can accelerate your labeling, you know, 10x, 100x is faster, kind of really change how your teams tackle these problems. Now, if you're interested in Snorkel, you might have run across the open source project, right? It, this has been going on for uh, at least seven years. S some of the earlier research code that was built that kind of made it to you could reproduce the early papers was open sourced. And so that's out there. What I wanted to let people know though, is that code only covers a small portion of an overall workflow using Snorkel. It really covers dealing with those conflicts between bringing the labeling functions in there. And this is why kind of that same academic team that built out all of that code created Snorkel AI to build an enterprise platform. So that way your SMEs, your data scientists have a full end-to-end -end way where they can kind of bring their data, work either in Python, either in a UI for SMEs, build those labeling functions, do that work and all the way out to kind of serving out kind of various machine learning tasks as well. The point of this, of this webinar isn't to kind of focus on snorkel flow. There's other webinars um, that do that that we can guide you to. But just want to kind of tail end the story with if you want to use programmatic labeling, this is where Snorkel has taken the time to build out an easy to use platform for programmatic labeling and other, other data centric applications as well. All right, John, I think I've hit the half hour mark and I pretty much covered what I wanted. Let's see kind of if there's kind of other questions. Great. So, yeah, for everyone, uh, feel free to ask questions on the QA pane. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Rajiv, let's take a couple common questions that we see. Mm -hmm. And let's start off with uh, what data modalities does Snorkel currently handle? Yeah. So, it, and it, it's an interesting point because I kind of, uh, I played around with this a little bit. So the overall approach of programmatic labeling really is invariant to data modalities. It doesn't really matter kind of what approach um, you use. It's possible to create programmatic labeling for that. Now, Within the platform at this point, Snorkel has decided to focus on kind of the, the various pieces that you see there with a heavy focus on, for example, text such as PDFs, te text classification, working with chat such as conversational AI as well. If you have structured data, that fits within the Snorkel flow. And then we have some other earlier, pro some projects on our roadmap that we're working with kind of, I I'm gonna call it in beta around things like images and time series as well. Great, can you tell us a little bit more about the types of platforms Snorkel Flow supports? Yeah, so I think that's one of the common questions is, is, is Snorkel Flow you know, just a web-based app or you know, how can I use it? Can I download it on my computer? You know, how does it work like that? So I think if you reach out and talk to Snorkel Flow, we'll be happy to kind of talk about that. We have a cloud hosted solution for people looking for kind of a, a typical kind of SaaS offering, but it's also possible if you want to host Snorkel Flow within your own environment, 
the application is built on Kubernetes. So it's easy if you have Kubernetes to install it kind of behind your firewall, which is often a concern for enterprises with kind of their data. Great. We have a couple more questions coming in. So Don asks, once you have a, a large enough sample of labeled data, is BERT good enough for predicting new content that is not seen? All? He says, we have played around using deep learning and it's almost equivalent around 93%. Yeah. So, I, so, so is the question, say that one more time, if you can. Yeah. And if you want, uh, Raj, in your community. Oh, is it? Oh, can I see it? Oh, you'll, ah, yeah, you should be able okay. to from Don. Yes, I can see it. Great. So yeah, so this is a, so the question, uh, oh, I should repeat the question. Um, can I, maybe can people see this on screen or? No, I can read it out for you. <clears throat> so, okay, yeah, why don't you read it out so everybody has it and then I can kind of answer Once it. you have a large enough sampled, <clears throat> once you have a large enough sample of labeled data, is BERT good enough for predicting new content that it has not seen already? We have played around using deep learning and it's almost equivalent around 93%. Yeah, so, so this hits at a, at, a, at a few things, right? So typical, typically kind of machine learning only works and only can like really learn from the history that you've given. If you haven't given it some examples before, you can't expect it when it does its predictions to do that. Now, this has changed a little bit with all these new language models like BERT that are able to basically understand or memorize, however you want to see it, a large corpus of information. So these models, because they've been trained on so much like BERT, often do kind of respond well to new examples. Now, the drawback always for enterprises is these examples are trained on things like Wikipedia or Reddit data that might not really match what the type of data and the type of you know, use cases that you have. So sometimes they generalize well if you're just kind of in the very conversational social media type place. But if you're working in, a, you know, let's say, financial transactions or you know, some type of specific warranty data for machines, well, then that those languages might not generalize as well. And, you know, there's steps of, you know, pre-training and fine tuning that you can do there, but it really kind of depends on the use case. So it's always hard to kind of give a general example, but in, uh, I don't know. Was that useful? <laughs> I could keep going. Oh, there. Yeah, Don, you, you can tell us uh, okay. if you have a follow-up question uh, while we wait to hear from you. But I think this was a question I asked you, Raj, how does the mm -hmm. technology adapt to new labels which don't exist in the data? Yeah. So, and I, and I'm going to go back to my visualization here because I think it's, it's, it's really, it's a really good question because, you know, that's often kind of what happens. And this is where we want to have a machine learning model because a machine learning model helps to generalize to new examples. Like even if your labeled examples don't cover it, that's where we want to. Now, of course, the more label examples you have, the better your machine learning model is going to be because it's going to have more information to help identify this. So we always want to give as much labeled data as possible, but we can also, you know, rely on the fact that machine learning models will generalize a little bit. So if we don't have the exact example there, it's covered. Great. Well, I don't see any additional questions. Oh, we have one more coming in. A couple more coming in. So we have one here in, in the chat, Raj, if you can see that. Give me a second here. Yeah. Or I can read it out to you if you Yeah, like. just read it out. Yeah, okay. it's hard. Uh, we have a lot of, I don't know, say Scala or Scala, Spark labeling function yeah. that we use on Databricks, I assume. I would have to pre-process using them to write intermediate files like on S3, <clears throat> which then Snorkel would ingest, question mark. Yeah. So, you know, kind of the, the, the Snorkel technology here is kind of very modular and extensible kind of with different technologies. And so that creation of that labeling functions that I showed, absolutely, you could create those labeling functions in Spark or Scala, if you have very large data sets and you want to do it quickly there, it's very easy to kind of create those labeling functions, bring in that, use the label model to reconcile those differences. So yeah, absolutely kind of easy to work across different technologies. And I'm not getting much into this kind of the snorkel flow platform, but it was really designed kind of for data science teams and IT teams to easily kind of extend and work with because we recognize, right? Every team comes and works with kind of a different set of technologies and doesn't want just a black box. 
Great. Well, it looks like we've answered uh, most of the questions. Uh, and again, everyone, thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you again in an upcoming webinar event. And I wish everyone a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you, everybody.